Everyone, uh, we want to respect everyone's time, so we do have quorum now. And so we're going to go ahead and get started with our meeting today. Uh, just to let you all know that uh, Rabbi Boone is not going to be able to join us today, but he did give us a message, and I'll read the message because it will explain exactly where he's at. Uh, he has said, Dear friends and fellow task force members, let me extend to all of you greetings from Israel, the Holy Land of all religions. Each and every one of us has had our faith and our beliefs that each of us, without doubt, believes in the holiness of life. If we as individuals and as a community want to be holy, like the Holy Land itself, then we need to be whole and united as one society. I want to thank you for working so hard for the whole entirety of Fort Worth. If we are whole with a W, then we can be fulfilled a holy with an H, Fort Worth, a city full of equity, equality, and peace for all. I look forward to seeing you next month. Blessings, Rabbi Blue. So I wanted to make sure to share that with you. Uh, we do have a couple of presentations with us today, so I'm going to let my co-chairs give opening remarks, and so then we'll get started with our, pro our agenda. I yield my remarks. Bob? Uh, I'll, I'll just say quickly, and you put a holy in there with an H? I have holy with an H. Lord have mercy. Uh, no, that's not good. I just want to say to the uh, my fellow task force members, we are down to what we used to call the nitty gritty, <coughs> trying to come up with some real solutions for the disparities that we've already identified. And time is getting short. And I just hope that we're able to come up with some things that will be good for us <coughs> to consider and then recommend to the council. I have no doubt that we will do that. And then after we do that, we've already talked to the uh, members of the council and business community that we would hope there would be others who would support us in those recommendations. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, next on our agenda is the approval of minutes from our April 16th and May 21st meetings. I will take a motion. I so move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, today we're going to have a discussion about there's been three strategic plans created between the City of Fort Worth, Fort Worth Chamber, and Visit Fort Worth. So today we're going to hear from Robert Stearns, City of Fort Worth, Jared Howard with Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce, and Bob Jamison um, to let us know a little bit about the strategic plans. And then we can also utilize that information to see how our recommendations fit in to, that, uh, to those strategic plans. So, Robert, Jared, Bob, who wants to go first? I guess I'll dive in then. Well, thank you all uh, for uh, having us out to really talk uh, about our strategic plan and some specifics about that. I know many of you were uh, a part of the advisory committee uh, that gave us some feedback and recommendations when we were developing the plan. So, uh, for those of you that did participate, thank you for that input. Uh, as y'all may be aware, that was a very long process. It took us about a year to complete the plan. Uh, finally presented it to council in December of last year. Uh, and they adopted the recommendations presented by TIP Strategies, uh, the consultants that completed the plan. Uh, and we've been working really for the past uh, six months or so on um, uh, the implementation phase of the document. Uh, I, I noticed that Bob had handouts uh, for Visit Fort Worth. I, I didn't bring a copy of our plan. It's about 500 and so pages, so I didn't think you all wanted to carry a large, uh, a large book around with you, but it is online. If you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, I, I do recommend that you um, go to uh, the city's webpage under uh, Economic Development Plan, ED Plan, uh, and you'll find uh, not only the uh, full plan, but the executive summary of the plan, which is a little bit easier to read, uh, and then uh, some target area reports that we did. So I'll basically just give you a, a high-level overview. I mean, the plan really focuses on three specific areas, and that is building up our competitiveness as a community, 
really enhancing our ability to grow and attract uh, the, the creatives that uh, really form the talent base of the types of companies that we're trying to uh, bring to Fort Worth. And then really focusing on development and redevelopment in some of our communities, specifically those communities that have been underserved, that have not seen some levels of investment uh, that we've seen in other parts over the city uh, for the past 10 to 15 years. Now, I will say that uh, the plan is, uh, it is the city's plan, and I say city, big C, as in the community, not city, small C, as in the organization. Uh, there are 200 plus strategies outlined in our plan. Uh, and, and the city's not going to, nor should it, uh, take the lead on all of those initiatives. So there are some things that the city will take the lead on. There are some that we'll continue to work with the chamber on and the chamber will take the lead on. There are some that Visit Fort Worth will take the lead on. And then there are other uh, strategies that uh, are going to be uh, come spread out among other entities within the community. So we talk about things like a medical innovation district. Well, that is something that we're really gonna rely on our hospitals to get engaged in and, and do a deep dive on. Uh, we talk about entrepreneurship and how do we build up our small businesses. So that's a partnership with the chamber, but there's other entities like uh, University of North Texas Health Science Center. There's a lot of incubators and co-workers, co-working spaces that have come into Fort Worth lately. Uh, that's partners at the Gwynn Campus, Tech Fort Worth, and Accelerate DFW. So again, it's, it's kind of a broad mix of partners uh, that we're going to bring together to uh, really drive this plan forward and implement uh, all those strategies. I will say a couple of things as we are in kind of year one of the implementation piece. Uh, one of the big things that we've drilled down on um, as it relates to economic development and business attraction uh, is an issue of wages and how that impacts our poverty levels overall in the city. Uh, so historically, the city has been somewhat silent uh, on wage requirements and our economic development incentive deals. Uh, primarily, we have been focused on uh, the amount of capital investment that a company is bringing to the community and the types of jobs or the number of jobs that they're bringing. Uh, what we haven't really drilled, on, drilled down on are the types of jobs. Uh, so while it's great to have a uh, you know, $30 million distribution center that's going to bring 200 to 300 jobs to Fort Worth, uh, if they're paying 12 to $15 an hour, I don't know that that's really helping us a whole lot. Uh, so. Uh, if you look at some of the recent data that comes out, and we really talk about cost of living, uh, I think I saw a recent report that in order to afford just a two-bedroom apartment uh, in Texas, so this is in Fort Worth, but in Texas, you have to be making about $19.22 an hour. Uh, and that's just to kind of keep within that, you know, 30% of your income is tied to housing. So uh, if you're having to make $19 an hour uh, just to afford a two-bedroom apartment in Texas, uh, again, I'm not sure that 14 to $15 an hour jobs really are helping us as a community. And so as we begin to think through our policies and how we uh, go after specific types of companies and specific types of industries, one thing that we're really starting to focus on is what are, what are the wage rates that these companies are paying? Um, you know, we, we have an unofficial standard that it's going to be about the uh, county median average, which is about 50, Judy, you may help me, 56,000. Uh, so that, that's kind of the, the ballpark that we're, that we're shooting for. But, but obviously, we definitely want uh, to attract jobs that are paying higher than that. But again, in order to attract those types of companies, I mean, if you're talking about attracting the uh, you know, the, the Toyotas and the J.P. Morgan Chases and maybe the Amazon HQ2s of the world. Uh, you have to have the workforce uh, to fill those types of positions. You have to have the structures in place, uh, both from the ISD through the Tarrant County College, through our university system to make sure that we are developing that work, future workforce. Uh, and then making sure that we are retaining the existing pipeline that's in the, in the market today. So, if we have TCU graduates and UTA and Texas Wesleyan and UNT, we need to make sure that we keep those folks here uh, in the community as opposed to going to other cities uh, to find employment. Or if they are staying here, make sure that we have the jobs to, um, um, uh, that they can fill as opposed to them having to drive all the way over to Dallas and other parts of uh, North Texas region to uh, find you know, that white collar employment that they're looking for. Uh, so that's uh, really one of the key things that we're looking at as it relates to the plan. Uh, the other thing that we um, dive down on, which I mentioned, is this aspect of community development. Uh, so again, as you all know, uh, in Fort Worth, we've had uh, 
areas that have seen some significant investment over the years. Uh, I won't name any names, but we can all drive around the community and see where that investment has occurred. But there are other parts of the city that have not seen that level of investment. And so as we're, as we're thinking about policies, again, uh, we want to understand what are the changes that we can make from a policy standpoint to ensure that we are moving, pushing investment in some of those areas um, while still maintaining the uh, attractiveness and investment that we've seen in other corridors of the city. Uh, you know, so whether that's uh, providing some enhanced level of incentive within underserved areas, whether that's being creative and uh, maybe putting together a fund that puts cash into a deal up front. Again, that's something historically we haven't done previously, but we're, we're trying to really look at best practices across the nation, understand what other communities may have done uh, to really help drive investment in some of those areas. And I think if we can begin to have some successes, uh, I think you'll see, uh, for example, areas like the near south side, which has a TIF and has really grown over the past 15 to 20 years, uh, because of that growth and that investment that they're seeing on that side of town, you're starting to see people are now looking across the freeway and saying, well, what can I do on the other side of I-35, on the eastern side? And you're starting to see some investment over there. So I think it, it is kind of this, this concept of if we can, we can take these existing areas that already have some growth and continue to seed them and make sure that we're doing all that we can to uh, ensure that investment occurs, that we'll start to see some of that other activity happen in other areas of the city. Uh, so that's really a broad overview. I know we just want to provide a general update on the plan and maybe get into some questions. Uh, but I will say as, as uh, Jared and Bob uh, come forward and talk about their specific plans, these plans are all working in context. So uh, while we have a large, again, citywide organization plan, it is definitely aligned with the Chamber's plan and how they're reorganize reorganizing. Uh, their focus over there, and it definitely uh, dovetails specifically with some things that Bob is doing at Visit Fort Worth. So I think the, 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 the most positive thing I can say about all of these plans coming forward is that they're, they're all very much in alignment for what we're trying to accomplish over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, and I think it's important uh, that, that's, that that being said, because I think in some communities you don't always have that uh, be the case. So with that, I will turn it over to Jared, maybe or Bob, I'm not sure who's gonna go up next and uh, they can talk about their plan and we'll open it up for questions. First off, let me say good afternoon, uh, evening, I actually think it is to everybody in the room, those that I might not have had a chance to speak to. Uh, I do stand or sit on behalf of, are you pointing? On behalf of the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce. Uh, <clears throat> let me start by saying thank you to this group. Uh, it is an incredible thing to see the work that the group has done, and we look forward with tiptoe anticipation to the work that you guys will do and to the results of the work, uh, and we're excited about that, and we're certainly part, excited to play a part in the uh, continued work that you are doing. Uh, it's no secret to anyone in the room, and probably not a, si a secret to anybody that's a resident of the city of Fort Worth, that the city is changing. Uh, and that's an incredible thing, and it's a great thing to be a part of. Uh, as the city changes, it has demanded that the organizations that represent the city change as well. Certainly the city is changing, uh, the CVB is changing, and the chamber is changing because you've told us that we needed to change. So for the last 18 to 24 months, we've been in listening mode, uh, listening to our constituents tell us what they wanted, what they'd like to see, what they want the chamber to look like, feel like, smell like, to be honest with you. And uh, as you all are aware, in the last six or so months, we rolled out our strategic plan in concert with what uh, has happened at Visit Fort Worth and what's happening at the city. And our strategic plan, although not 500 pages, uh, is pretty robust. But it's broken down into four specific areas, and I will be brief in highlighting each of those four areas, uh, one of which Robert has already alluded to being economic development. Uh, while um, it is important that we chase uh, the next Amazon headquarters, I think it'd be irresponsible on our ha behalf if we didn't pursue that. Uh, we've also got to chase the small business guy, and that's what I'm going to speak to first. Uh, I lead our small business and entrepreneur efforts. Uh, the definition of our city is one of the unique things about the city of Fort Worth right now is that we're still young enough in our evolution that we can create an identity for our city, and that's probably not true for other cities this size. They are who they are, barring something um, uncertain, i.e. a Detroit.
But we've got a golden opportunity in Fort Worth, and one of the areas in which we want to address that, specifically through the strategic pl plan, is in the area of small business. The reality is, certainly in the Fort Worth ISD, the preponderance of the students that graduate from the Fort Worth ISD will never set foot on a college campus. Uh, and for a very long time, we have told our students, not exclusively in Fort Worth, but throughout Amer American society, that the road to success is, the r is college. And college is certainly a road to success, but it's not the road, not the only or the exclusive road to success. And so we, what we want to tell our ISD students is that, listen, it's not a requirement that you go to college unless you want to be a brain surgeon, unless you want to be an, air, an aerospace engineer. Those things require college, but the reality is there's a real opportunity for you to make a really good living for yourself without ever having set foot on a college campus. And you can be a small business owner at 14 or 15 or 18 or 20. And that's a space that the chamber has ignored for uh, a significant moment in, uh, portion of time. So what we're doing right now is we're working on an initiative to, that's full of outreach, right? So the reality is that the chamber is downtown in the ivory tower. But I grew up in Southeast Fort Worth, and a lot of the people that I grew up with don't know anything about a chamber, and they certainly wouldn't find any value in coming to the chamber. So we're going to go out into the neighborhoods and tell the neighborhoods who we are so they don't have to come downtown uh, to the ivory tower. That's where we are in the small business space. We're, we're talking about growing tentacles, if you will, to get into the communities, into the, the districts w in, w in partnership with the city so that everybody has the benefit of, of its chamber, so that the chamber in, this, in the city our size benefits the person in Stop 6 as much as it does the person in Westover Hills. Um, in the small business space, we want to partner, partner with the city to make it easier to open a small business, but more importantly, to make it easier to be successful. So we're in the process of tilling the ground right now, not to make it easier for you to start a small business, because what, quite frankly, to start a small business, all you need is a DBA which costs about $30 at your local courthouse. You can get that in a matter of five minutes. But it's incredibly difficult to be successful in the small business space. But if our small business um, field is not successful, then it's hard for our city to be. Because all the science tells you that the, the, the base of the economy is in the spirit of small business. So we're working on being more collaborative with our uh, council in, in the city uh, through the partnership with the city through what we do at Visit Fort Worth to make it friendlier in this, or easier in this city to be successful in the small business space. And there's more information coming in as we continue to roll out this vision. I've only been with the chamber for about eight weeks, so we're not quite ready to roll out a, a, a vision or an initiative yet, but stay tuned for that. But that's one of those. Uh, economic development, which I won't spend a great deal of time in because Robert had already spoken to that, we do still have to chase Amazon. Again, it would be irresponsible on our behalf not to chase Amazon or not to ensure that American Airlines stays in Fort Worth. Uh, we're cer certainly working in that regard. I've got a counterpart, Chris Strayer, who recently moved here from uh, Columbus, Ohio, to make sure that we cross that particular T and dot that specific I. In addition, the talent piece. And so if that doesn't speak to the fact that we're in concert with the, chamber, with the city, um, <coughs> I'm regurgitating everything Robert has said, which speaks to the fact that we are working in concert and collaboratively with each other, but, but we do have an opportunity in the governmental adv advocacy space, which is where Re Rebecca Montgomery is working. And then finally, so I've mentioned small business, governmental advocacy, uh, economic development, and then finally talent and workforce. Uh, Dr. Tony Edwards is, is five weeks into his career at the chamber and he comes to us from Charleston State because we recognize that there's a gaping hole in what Amazon is looking for and what Fort Worth has to offer. And maybe we, there's not a gaping hole. Maybe we just haven't built a message or a narrative that's strong enough to make Amazon know that we've got the people here. We've got everything you're looking for here. And so we're working with the city uh, to tell that story, if you will. So we're changing. Uh, we'd like to think we're changing for the better. Uh, we, if I can be candid, we no longer want to be the chamber known as shaking hands, and known for shaking hands and kissing babies. We want to continue to shake hands. We want to continue to, to uh, kiss babies. But we also want to be effective in the work that we're doing. And those are the four areas in which we're targeting our strategic plan to make that happen. I'm not sure if it's time for a question, but I had a question, so. It's better. It's fine. Uh, this, is, this is Ty Simpson. Uh, oh, Ty Simpson, okay. I didn't know he was on. Ty, go ahead. Yes, I don't know. I don't know if it's, if, if it's okay, okay at this point to ask the question for the last presenter, but so I, I, will, I have a question. Sure. Ty, do you 
want to wait. Let's, uh, Bob is uh, the last one to make a presentation. That way we can get all the presentations. To okay, that, that's, Q &A. okay. That, that, that's okay. That's that's fine. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm be sorry. the first one to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> sure. Well, let me uh, join Robert and Jared in uh, in uh, thanking you all for the opportunity to present the. Uh, a little bit of background on Visit Fort Worth, formerly known as the Fort Worth Convention and Visitors Bureau, and to talk a bit about our destination master plan, and uh, also echo, uh, uh, echo their sentiments in terms of the appreciation the work of this committee is doing on behalf of our community. And uh, you know, and it is an important point in time, and uh, and the work you're doing is significant and we're pleased to contribute uh, a, a little bit of our story in hopes that that helps uh, form your recommendations in a way that uh, is helpful. Yeah, just because I think that uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce and certainly the city's economic development department are more commonly understood, let me just give you a little bit of background on the Convention and Visitors Bureau, now visit Fort Worth. and. And it's an organization that was formed as a department of the chamber about 52, 53 years ago with a focus on, um, on developing and facilitating, supporting that uh, segment of our economy that is directed towards travel and tourism and uh, with an intent to encourage visitation from other places in Texas, other places across the country, other places around the world. and. Uh, uh, and so that, is, that, that represents the work of our organization, trying to generate economic impact through uh, the travel sector. Uh, we just reported through our research that, um, that, uh, that Fort Worth has again hit another record number in terms of visitation and with 9.1 million people coming to, to visit Fort Worth in 2017. It is, uh, those visitors have a $2.3 billion economic impact. And there are 23,000 Fort Worthians that are working in the travel and tourism industry in order to take care of those 9.1 million people. Um, and their jobs are paid for by that $2.3 billion economic impact. Um, one of the one of the things that I think is important to, to, to consider as, you know, as we work to, you know, to make sure that the right infrastructure and support is in place in order to, to grow, as the city grows, that this industry segment grows, is to, you know, is to recognize that uh, through economic up and downturns and then in recovery periods, the uh, tourism, the tourism job market responds more quickly, and in the last recession, it led the nation in job creation um, coming out of the recession. And so, uh, you know, first of all, uh, obviously, a robust travel infrastructure or industry in this community is it putting a lot of people to work and creating a diversity of uh, job opportunities at all levels and in all size organizations. Additionally, uh, you know, this is an industry that does have in place uh, an education track that exists. Uh, I, I've worked personally with the hospitality program at Northside High School, but I know through Fort Worth ISD there are other similar programs that focus on the hospitality industry, and that feeds into TCC's hospitality program, which is currently housed at the Southeast Campus. And uh, the University of North Texas up in Denton also has a very well-regarded hospitality program, all creating opportunities for young people that might find an interest in this industry, a way to, to find employment beyond just you know, following the path that I did, which was start as a bellman and become a front desk clerk and work your way up. But there are other ways matching on the job experience with education to, um, to really enter in the industry at a, at a management level. So, um, so the industry is, is, is pervasive throughout uh, the community and um, 
you know, and, and our destination master plan was really designed to envision those elements in Fort Worth that would support the continued growth of, um, of the city as a destination, um, you know, that would draw uh, people from all around. And um, there are there are three things that are impacted by visitors. You know, they're, they're spending, I mean, three things that can help grow the uh, impact. And one is to increase the number of people that are coming. One is to take the number of people that are coming and find ways to extend their stay. And then in addition to finding ways to have them extend their stay, give them more options for places and ways to spend their money. And so in the, you know, in the booklet that I did hand out, which is a condensed version of our destination master plan, it does talk about the five areas of focus that were developed through a nine-month period of community um, focus sessions and, uh, and uh, digital outreach or email outreach, uh, you know, just really um, pulling all sorts of thoughts not only from the community, but also from customers, meeting planning customers, tour travel customers that uh, are familiar with the city and had, uh, and, and had observations to make. And it focused on things like enhanced experiences. So if you're trying to encourage people to stay longer to the degree that there are more things to do or that there are, uh, you know, or there are a variety of options to include even in just a day that, uh, that we look at those different opportunities. We've talked about strengthened messaging, uh, the, you know, making sure that as our marketing efforts communicate the story of the city of Fort Worth, that we're reflecting it in a way that suggests that all are welcome. And uh, you know, we continue to take a look at what are the best practices we see out there and, and to evolve our communication around that. But that also means that we're working side by side with the organizations represented by Robert and Jared, you know, to ensure that there is a growing amount of a growing attempt at consistency of messaging and that there is alignment in how we're, the language we're using to describe Fort Worth as a destination. We talk about expanded facilities as one of the areas of focus and, uh, and our industry does rely on or has benefited from the fact that the city has made several significant investments in facilities like the Convention Center, Will Rogers Memorial Coliseum and the like um, and that those are uh, uh, areas that, that help um, create opportunity for uh, conventions and meetings and conferences. Conventions can be a great way to introduce, or a proven way to introduce a city to, um, to people that might then ultimately consider bringing a business here um, or relocating here themselves. And uh, so to the degree that we continue to work with these other two organizations and align our sales efforts around particular industry convention activity, that also then creates ways that, uh, you know, that we can help draw, you know, build a case of, you know, or build success for the efforts of the other two, the other two organizations. Improved connectivity is another focus area and it really talks about transportation and making that experience for the visitor a seamless one as they need to get around and certainly what benefits the visitor also benefits those of us that live here. And then lastly, there is a, uh, you know, a, you know, there are items that were surfaced as important initiatives for our, uh, for our community relative to the traveler or the visitor that deal with uh, collaboration and, you know, and examples of collaboration that uh, have been longstanding partnerships with our organization has been uh, relationships and, you know, uh, and funding mechanisms for the, not only the Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, but also the Fort Worth Metropolitan Black Chamber of Commerce, who have been longstanding and great partners in helping identify, um, you know, minority-based uh, conventions and meetings and making sure that uh, we are successful when we're out trying to attract those groups here as well. So 
those are the elements of our, um, you know, those are the elements of our plan. Some other things that I think are important to bear in mind about the industry as a whole is that while you might think of it as, you know, you know, what comes to mind might be this hotel or that hotel as a large employer. In fact, the industry is made up of many medium and small businesses. It allows for or supports uh, a high level of entrepreneurialism. And so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity that comes from a, robo a robust uh, travel and tourism um, segment of our economy. And uh, so that's the goal. Thank you. Thank you. Time. We're going to open it up again with questions. Yes, I just had a question regarding the um, the outreach initiatives and the small business development. Is any of that programming or any of those trainings going to allow small businesses to, you know, learn how to gain access to capital or any type of training or maybe even relationships with some local banks? Absolutely. The vision is for that training to be comprehensive. And so we are collaborating right now with a portfolio of small business owners to under both successful and some that have not been as successful as others uh, to understand the mandate uh, on the city and its resources. So what does that look like? What does a, small, a successful small business look like? What did he or she as a proprietor need when, she, when her idea, his or her idea was evolving? Uh, when you talk to Carolyn Phillips at Alchemy Pops, you know, when you talk to you know, Billy Joe at Billy Joe's Lawn Mowing ser Service. We've interviewed lots of those people to understand what that looks like, and we are working incredibly hard to make sure that that comprehensive solution is available for him or her when they're ready to make that step happen. Thank, thank you. Hey, Todd, this is uh, Robert Stearns with the city. Let me uh, jump in on that as well, because if you are not aware, uh, the city has had a program for about 20 years uh, to help small business owners at the Gwynn campus uh, to really do the specific types of things that you're asking about, um, uh, to not only with training but access to capital. And when I say access to capital, that is not just uh, the larger banking institutions that will, are willing to step up and provide funding for a credit-worthy small business owner, but I'm talking about some of the partners like People Fund. Uh, and Alliance Lending and William Mann CDC who are willing to put dollars in for a new business owner who may not have a track record yet or who may have had some blips in their credit history and they can't go to a, to a bank and get traditional financing. So those tools are out there. Uh, I hate to say that the Gwynn campus is the worst kept secret in Fort Worth, but it really is. Uh, and, and the more people can learn about what that facility has to offer uh, and, and how that relates to some of the things that the Chamber is doing as it relates to small business, uh, I, I think that's just going to be a compliment to their overall effort. So, so please, if you're not aware of it, give me a shout. I, could, I can take you on a tour and uh, show you about all the facilities we have out there. Just a quick question. The proof of this is the growth of small business. Can you tell me anything about the growth of small business over maybe the last 10 years? Yeah, I mean, so I think Jared mentioned, I mean, so about, you know, in any community, I'm going to say at Fort Worth in particular, about, you know, 90% of your uh, real job growth is coming from small businesses. Um, you know, I don't have the specific numbers off the top of my head as it relates to the uh, back uh, clients, but I can tell you that on average uh, at the Business Assistance Center between uh, the back, which is the city's operation, uh, Tech Fort Worth and Idea Works, you know, we were averaging about 1,500 or so clients that came through there on an annual basis. Of that, I'd probably say our job creation was probably about 700 or so a year, uh, and, and that those numbers are out there on our on our annual report. So I can I get specifics on it. I just don't have them off the top of my head right now. Okay, but also there's uh, you should have you do follow through, right? I mean, you do the training, follow through. Uh, how long are these companies? What's the average lifespan of these companies? You know, it really depends on the company. I mean, and, and it depends on where they approach us in the, in the life cycle. So, you know, we get companies that are, uh, you know, Jared woke up this morning and said, hey, I got a great idea for a business. I go down and get my DBA and I'm, I've got a thought, I got an idea, but I don't know where to go with it from there. So we take people at that very early stage all the way up to, um, you know, a, a 
medical technology company that's been in business for a couple of years. So, I, you know, I would say, you know, for the most part, you're probably spending at, at least about two years within some various levels of program, either at the back. I know Tech Fort Worth's actual program lasts about two years. Um, so between two to three years from the standpoint of how long they're actually kind of engaging and interacting with, um, uh, with the campus. And then, you know, beyond that, uh, it's really kind of continuing to kind of keep these touch points with them. So Jared mentioned Carolyn Phillips, which grew out of the Business Assistant Center. She runs Alchemy Pops. Uh, started with a little push cart. She's now got a brick and mortar location in their south side. Uh, so you go from, from that type of business owner all the way up to a business owner like um, ZS Pharma, uh, which got started out of Tech Fort Worth and got bought by AstraZeneca for $490 million a couple of years ago. Uh, or a company like Eosera, which just got a huge contract with CVS to put their earwax nationwide. So again, it, it kind of spans the gamut. So it, again, could be a couple of years, could be five, 10 years. But you have a system in place to follow up. And so if someone they find themselves in three years needing help, then they can also, they're also available to continue. They can always come back, yep. Yeah. Because it takes about three years to get the business set up. It does. It does. And, and you know, some clients, you know, I mean, the, the success rate beyond two years, as you know, is, is not good. Uh, and so uh, you get some that, you know, they burn out. Maybe they find out that business didn't work for them. Maybe they just found out entrepreneurship doesn't work for them. Uh, so you do have kind of a, a large number of, of what I would say, I wouldn't even wouldn't call them failures. I would just say recalibration. Uh, and then they're trying to figure out what their next steps are. And then you have some business owners or entrepreneurs that, that that's what they do, that they get in, they get it going. Five years, they're looking for an exit strategy and they're on to their next gig, or maybe shorter than that. So again, entrepreneurship is kind of across the board. So we try to be as flexible as we can be to anyone who's coming in the door and saying, what are the specific needs that that person has? But I think you have know, working with us with the economic committee, if you could, though, it'd be great to get that information about the success rate. Yeah, like I said, I can. Uh, we that's in our annual report, so I can provide the, uh, the annual reports that we submit uh, or that we pull together uh, that relates to what the performance of the Gwynn campus has been. Yeah. If I may, one of the things that I did not mention in the overview is that in uh, the small business and entrepreneur space, there are two silos, if you will. There is a small business piece, and uh, this is the chamber speaking. By the way, this is Jared at the chamber, and the entrepreneurship piece, and and those are distinct in today's society. There is a trend in tr the entrepreneurial space right now and we haven't been able to wrap our minds around the delta between a small business and an entrepreneur, a small business owner and an entrepreneur because historically they've been, you know, in this one and the same, interchangeable. But that's not the case today. Uh, entrepreneurs right now are thinking more along the lines of enterprise. Uh, he or she grows the business to a point to where he or she can sell it and become a billionaire and move on to the next thing, whereas a small business is the Carolyn Phillips that we spoke about earlier. Uh, and so we are building a strategy for both, because quite frankly, both of them are um, the hot items, if you will, as it relates to employment. I come from a large employer here in Fort Worth about two months ago, and that employer right now is struggling to keep their younger employee employees because quite frankly, they don't want to work between nine and five. And not only do they not want to work between nine and five, they don't want to come to work every day. It's not that they're opposed to working every day, they just don't want to come to the building to work every day. They'd rather work from home. That's a reality. And so they're going to college and they're spending $200,000 on a degree and they don't want to work for the large companies. So they want to own a small business, whether that's you know, cleaning tires or you know, finding the solutions for eye drops. That's what they want to do and so we have to be uh, nimble enough to be able to accommodate both of those. And I didn't speak to that before, which is why I wanted to mention that just then, just now. Uh, how will you address the need to, uh, there's such a disparity in some of the services, uh, <coughs> businesses that we have. How will y'all address the needs to build the capacity in those areas, in those state codes or services? Between entrepreneurship and small business. So, so, so Rosa, the, the low hanging fruit, if you will, is the small business space. Right, because it's easier, it's simpler. I think we mentioned it a moment ago, you can go to the courthouse and get a DBA and five minutes later you open an account and you're in business, right? Uh, that's the lower hanging fruit. It's easier to do, it's easier to build an ecosystem. Uh, and we wanna be robust in that particular space because it produces the greatest and, and quickest return. Uh, so we're not complete, 
with the entrepreneurship strategy because it is so incredibly complicated, as I've learned over the last you know, eight to 10 weeks or so. In fact, I'll be in Buffalo on Wednesday at the IEDC Small Business and Entrepreneur Conference learning more about how other cities have done that and been successful there. Uh, we're going to benchmark some cities that are known for their small business and entrepreneur space, i.e. Austin, right? i.e. Kansas City. They've done incredibly well in the entrepreneur space, and we want to learn how, how they've done that and, and maybe mimic some of that. But we, anything we do, we want to tailor to Fort Worth because, quite frankly, uh, we, we, we'd like to think as Fort Worth as an entrepreneurial place, and it certainly is, but maybe tech's not the industry, right? Maybe tech is unique to Austin. Maybe we're better in whatever, you name the industry, but we want to build resources that are tailored to what the people in our city How will you work with MWE businesses to help build those? Because, um, good, bad, different, I remember being in Austin when I listened to their disparity study, and they were not doing very well with their MWE small businesses. That's right. So if I can be candid, uh, while I was being vetted for this job, Rosa, uh, I was vetting the job as well. Uh, I grew up in Southeast Fort Worth, and I have an incredibly strong affinity for Southeast Fort Worth. And I would not have taken this job unless I were convinced that the box that you mentioned would be checked as a part of the effort. That's why we're talking about outreach. And uh, the people that I report to at the chamber are, are fully aware and understand that outreach will be a component of what we do. And it, it will be based on geography, quite frankly. So the benefits that we get in the CBD are the same ones that will be available in Como or in Southeast Fort Worth or in, on the north side. Uh, so there won't be a, a delta between the benefits as it relates to the chamber that we're making available for the constituents of the city. That won't be the case anymore. That's part of the messaging that we heard when we were listening and part of the strategy to address as we go forward. So, and and I, I would ask, if you will, hope, hold us accountable to that. Pick up the phone. You know how to reach me. Call me and say, hey, Jared, what's happening here? You know you don't have any problems doing that. Everybody knows Rosa will pick up the phone and ask the question. And I encourage everybody to ask the hard question. I know Mr. Dansby will pick up the phone and call me. Uh, it, call me. Pick up the phone and say, how are we doing this? Where are we here? Because I need to be held accountable, and quite frankly, it is my goal and my vision to when you call me, I've got an answer readily available for you that satisfies you in such a way that you're proud of the work that we're doing at the chamber. And, uh, and I'm just going to say it's going to, it happens on both ends because we as a community also need to make sure that we're ready for the opportunities that are presented. Uh -huh. Because if, if they are not ready, those small businesses, they will fail and we don't want them to fail. Uh -huh. We want them to succeed. So, yeah, thank you. Just one quick question, and, and I will be alluded to it. Uh, as I said, we're in the stage now. We're going to be making recommendations to the council and perhaps to the business community. You've got your plans already. Uh, we don't need to duplicate that if you've already got those in place. But uh, particularly, Robert, when you say that some of these issues we've been dealing with for 20 years and the disparity is still the same, what can you give us? Can you give us one or two recommendations that we can make to the city council or to the business community? And now I know Bob, you you are on the board of the chamber, so you you know that. What what can we recommend that will actually solve some of these disparities, as opposed to uh, continuing the disparity? And we talked about this twenty years down the road with the same issue. Any ideas? I mean, I, I know you. I know you thinking, I know you're planning, I know you're listening. Tell us what we can recommend to the council that can make a change. Well, Bob, right, you, you, so I don't know if I have a recommendation at this point for the council, but, you know, to my, but the recommendation for the business community would be to fund the chamber more fully than it has been historically. So if you're out, you know, if a recommendation here with the kind of plans that are in place and the direction that the chamber is going, that it have the resources that it needs in order to be able to do the work that's being uh, envisioned here. I, you know, just another voice saying that the business community needs to financially support this organization would be very important. And some of that funding would come to Southeast Fort Worth. Uh, well, I, think that's, that, I think that's what you hear the gentleman well, say. Well, I mean, but it has. Well, but the city has given funds to the minority chambers. We, and we, we know what the city has done. But we haven't seen the effects of it. Well, 
then that, that's where we need to hold our chambers accountable. Charles. Could I help there a little bit? Because this is, this is in my committee, the development committee's purview. And, and Bob Ray, what you just asked is exactly what I've asked Robert and Michelle's assisting with this to give us some recommendations on how we can move the needle. In other words, policy proposals we can take to city council as a part of the task force recommendations that would that would have a measurable impact on these disparities that we've already had. I don't know if he's if he can address that at the moment, but that's what we're trying to come up with through the committee. I didn't mean to give a hand call either. Bishop Man, nine point one million visitors, two point four billion dollars of economic impact. must evaporate in our community, I don't see it. Uh, but the question is, what's the annual, you suggested that maybe to increase their annual budget, but what's presently their annual budget, and you said an increase to what to, to make them more efficient? So right now, our annual, annual budget is about four and a half million dollars. At the end of this strategic plan, we hope to have raised to secured about $8 million per year for the next four years. And, and that, if I can be candid, is simply scratching the surface. And for some reference there, Oklahoma City, which is about half the size of Fort Worth, has a $13 million per year. Their chamber has about a $13 million per year annual budget. How much of your current budget goes to small businesses funding that program? I'm sorry? How much of your budget actually goes to funding those programs you talked about? So, uh, <laughs> I mentioned earlier at the chamber, we shake lots of hands and kiss lots of babies, right? So we host lots of events. Uh, they are critical to what we do, critical to our mission. Uh, they uh, afford us the connections with the people that support the chamber and the organizations that do as well. So a significant portion of that goes toward those events. Uh, this is why the chamber does so many events, uh, because they become essentially fundraisers for us. And part of the danger about what we've done in the historically at the, in the chamber space is events are good, but events are not unique. And so in 2018, in the eight, 10 weeks that I've been at the chamber, I have discovered that there are other entities throughout our cities uh, throughout our city doing the same types of events that the chamber is doing and guess what they're asking for the same dollars that the chamber is asking for which makes it really difficult for us to go to those large organizations or even the small organizations and say this is uniquely what the chamber is doing which is part of the t mandate on us to be different about how we go forward with doing what we're doing in, uh, in the future so uh, Bob is absolutely accurate we can't do what we do without the funding uh, right now, again, to answer the question more, more directly, approximately 50% of what we do uh, is used for the work, the actual work that we do, and a large portion of that is used to pay for the events that we put on, quite frankly, and that's unfortunate. Charles? I wanted to take the conversation back to one of the first things Robert mentioned, which has been an issue we've debated in the Economic Development Committee, and that relates to the, the wage level for jobs where where an employer a corporation is approaching the city looking for tax incentives economic incentives and the question becomes what, what's the most important thing we want to see for that in other words obviously the size of the initial investment is a 10 million dollar investment is a hundred million dollar investment are they creating 10 jobs are they create a thousand jobs, but then whatever that number is, what is the wage level and benefits that we go along with those jobs? So assuming that the city has a limited amount of resources that it can uh, use for economic incentives, what are we really doing if we're creating these $10 an hour jobs? Now the debate that we've had in the committee is, well, $10 an hour job is $10 more for somebody that doesn't have a job, right? Uh, but you're really not, you're not lifting anybody out of poverty. 
with these low-wage jobs. So the debate is if we're going to revamp the city's incentive policy to pri prioritize higher paying jobs, what might be the trade-off for that? You know, it might be, well, I can create some higher paying jobs, but there are going to be fewer jobs that I can do otherwise. How does that, how does the wage level compare in terms of a priority with where in the city those jobs are created? Uh, so I, I'm not proposing anything. I think that's just part of what we're grappling with at the committee that'll be a, a policy issue that we'll hopefully address. And do you want to add any more to that? Yeah, well, Charles, you, you kind of jumped in on my, uh, my, my one comment I was going to make. But yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, from the standpoint of something that the committee can, can the task force can really kind of think through a little bit is, is specifically this question. So, um, you know, if, if, if we are attracting businesses that are paying higher wages, again, I, I think if that company is going into, you know, the central business district or going into West 7th or going into Alliance, I mean, I, I think we understand what that what that wage rate should be. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't help us to uh, have lower paid wages in, in those areas. But uh, if, if a company says, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in, the, in doing something in Southeast Fort Worth or South Fort Worth or East Side, and I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna bring 200 jobs over to the East Side. Well, to Charles's point, you know, $10 may not be what we wanna see, but $10 may be more than uh, what's in the neighborhood now. Alternatively, alternatively, I could say, well, why are we seeding low paying jobs in our underserved communities? So I think that's an argument that we need to make. So how do we, how do we strike that balance? How do we say we want to have jobs and investment in the neighborhood, uh, but what level should that salary be at? Because uh, I don't know that coming right out of the box, it should be 56000 a year, but I don't think it should be 20000 a year either. Uh, and so uh, as you all kind of think through from an economics base how that might work, I'd, I'd love to hear some feedback on that. Uh, the other thing that I would mention uh, from the small business side uh, is you look at, Jerry kind of mentioned that there's this, there's this uh, split right now between entrepreneurship and small business. Uh, and, and entrepreneurship are those uh, young entrepreneurs that are developing apps and seeking venture capital and all that great stuff, the, the, all, the, all the fun stuff you read about in the magazines. But if you continue to read about those developments, you see that there are significant gaps for female-owned companies and companies owned by people of color. Uh, they don't have access to capital from a venture capital standpoint. They don't have access to the resources. Uh, and, and I would say if the camera's on, okay. I will say that, uh, that, that I think there are a certain level of female-led, minority-led entrepreneurs uh, who do not feel that we have a welcoming enough environment in Fort Worth. Uh, and so as we talk about entrepreneurship, and we talk about how do we develop our ecosystem and what are the things we need to put in place, how do we try to attract those types of entrepreneurs to the city and how do we help grow them? Uh, because if you look at, you look at statistics, um, I think I saw something 74% of uh, kind of VC capital entrepreneurs are male, a uh, vast majority of them are white male. So there, there's a gap there that I think we need to try to find some ways to fill. And I think that's why visiting some of these uh, tech centers that Jared is talking about, these communities that have done it and hopefully have some, seen some success with it, uh, will lend itself to uh, helping us develop some strategies around that. So again, my, my, my two pieces would be wages, maybe some recommendations on the wages, and really some recommendation on, uh, from an entrepreneurship, small business standpoint, uh, you know, I, I don't know that, that that's something that the city should fund, whether there's programs out there that we need to tie into, but I do think that that's an area that uh, could, could be an interest point for the committee. When you said that it's not a welcoming city, what would your interpretation of that? Welcoming being that, and I'm, I'm not gonna pick on anyone in particular, but I, and I think if you go to any number of entrepreneurship events in the community, uh, I, I think they are still overwhelmingly white, to be honest with you. Um, and, and I don't think that those, 
I'm not that those people have any, the people that are running these events have any um, malice in their hearts. I don't think that that is meant to be exclusionary. I, I think it just, that's just the circle they run in. No, I, I thought you said that Fort Worth's not a welcoming city. Well, no, that's what I mean. So that's, I'm talking about the, the groups within, within the city that are engaged in these entrepreneurship activities. I just don't, I think there's a, uh, potential to impact the diversity levels because I talk to some of these entrepreneurs and they say well I still need to travel over to Dallas to really find a group of people that look like me that I can work with and so that's that's what I mean by uninviting yeah not that not that there's anything a specific barrier that's put up just you know being comfortable in the group I guess <laughs> what if we came back with a recommendation to develop a strategic plan that would be specifically uh, related to increasing the uh, minority participation and specifically that would address Southeast Fort Worth. Are the, and I guess my question really is, is, are, is there an opportunity within what we've done so far to create a major paradigm shift and create something that's unique to a specific area? Now, we already talked about the medical community. The medical community was terrible. It was terrible. All of the little bars that were in that area, income, I mean, it was it was pitiful. But it took the group coming together and even the funeral homes and all funding a plan. Have we done that for some of the smaller communities that seem to not be able to come up at all? And is there a possibility that we can do that? And that in that unique um, thing that's over the Gwen Center, do they have somebody who can help them with bonds? Because that's what I get to see on the other side, is they can't get bonded. Who's doing that for minorities in this area? There's several people, that because there's a lot of bonding classes that go on throughout Dallas and Fort In fact, DFW Airport does uh, sessions uh, every year. Um, and, okay, I'm going to put my no old exactly. chamber hat on. Okay. Uh, we had businesses that would come in because they, they said that they couldn't get bonding. Well, some of it has to do with credit issues that they have. The others are that they don't want to invest in, in purchasing of the bonding. I, I so and there's a pro and con. And the businesses have to understand that they have to invest in themselves. They don't need to go out and buy a million-dollar bond right off the top of the hat. They can buy a smaller bond and grow their business and grow that bonding. And, of course, you know I'm at DFW airport been there a long time and I get to see the other side of that and I get to hear the stories and I believe there's an opportunity to create a pathway and maybe an algorithm for those individuals who would like to be in business to have somebody who's willing to take a high risk bond and, and get a bond out there for them. I just think that if we if we strategically go after target areas that we can make a difference because that's where the focus will be. And if we can do some of that, and, and we use it as we're using the medical community as a pilot, and, and the proof is there. And I know that Paul just retired, but the story tells itself in the medical community. And I think that we have an opportunity to attract a business who's willing to put some put a business there and just, just highlight that. Because we have several areas. It's not just Southeast Fort Worth. We can go out to Como. We can go to North Side. And if we can get one I was that's going to be, your if we can, <laughs> 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 over here in the southeast for work, I, I, know north north side. Side. I know Northside very well. So if we could do some of that, though, in a strategically supported area where all the chambers are coming together, the city's coming together, and we're targeting that with some indicators and outcome performance measures, it just seems like we're missing it because we're so big picture. We need to zero down and get some targets. Is there a possibility that we could do that? So without showing a great deal of, because we're not ready to promote or roll it out yet, the small business and entrepreneurship vision at the chamber yet. So without taking too deep a dive into that vision, it, it includes exactly, Ms. Biggins, what you just mentioned. Uh, we will partner with each council district in the city. It is truly a partnership with the city and we will develop eight or 10, depending on when it's complete, unique strategies for these, for small business hubs, if you will. So the reality is what's needed in West Fort Worth is completely different than what's needed or what's ideal in East Fort Worth. And so with this 
council specific approach, we will be able to tailor and uniquely craft a vision that's unique for that respective district. And so if, if the MWBE um, reality is an issue in one district, then we'll build strategies around that. Uh, so, so what I would ask for from the group as it relates to the Fort Worth Chamber is uh, some patience, and I'm not talking about years, I'm just talking about six months, and your public support as you talk to your respective organizations and people. Talk about the work that the chamber is doing and call me, Ms. Biggins, and ask me. I'll tell you, if you call me tomorrow and you say I want to come and talk to you about the vision, I'll tell you what that looks like. Uh, but, but hold us accountable. Uh, to that end, but it is uh, a pretty comprehensive strategy, and it will address the very some of the very things that you mentioned a moment ago. Charles, does that make sense to you? Your committee. I was going to say, and I hope I don't take you off too far, but I also think that there'll be similar strategies in the talent development side. You know, I've been a part of those discussions. There's a lot of things that we would love to do on the workforce side that we have limited funds for and go too far off our charge that we're held accountable for, that the discussion has been that the chamber could then take that up. And I think it would address a lot of the things you're talking about, like the, in the city's um, study, they came, they kept saying, oh, the, the Workforce Board has a beautiful aerospace consortium, and we do, and we would love to do more of those, but we're not really funded to do that. So, okay, that's one of the ideas for the Chamber to look at that. Health care, hospitality, more of those positions where somebody could start at the entry level and then have the career pathways that could lead to other kind of positions. And I don't want to get into all that, but I, again, I just think there's a lot of strategies there within the Chamber's vision that could help all of the city of Fort Worth. Well, how do we get a specific recommendation? We need recommendations. I know, I, I was then trying I have to. Think of one I think Charles' mind is going. <laughs> he's thinking, he's taking notes. So, so I'll work on that, Charles. Hold a bond election specifically for the chamber. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. That was a joke. I know the cameras are on. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Just, just real quick. Um, East Side Quarter is really opening up down Rosedale. A lot of effort, a lot of money has been put into that. I think it's a great place. And the only thing, and I'm glad, I think one of the things that's happening in our community is um, education, that maybe some of these people aren't taking as much advantage. So I would like to see more of an educational effort being made to inform these potential entrepreneurs and small business sure. owners. Sure. I would like to see that. Um, and the $10 an hour job, man, I don't know what I'd pay first with $10 an hour, but when the only e real economic development in our community is I can see it, and I ride the streets every day, there's Family Dollar. So and I'm sure they're not making plenty of bucks an hour in Family Dollar. So I think um, East Side would welcome $10 an hour as a starting place. And, and, and again, they're living below the poverty level, but it sure as hell got to be Family Dollar. I, I saw a new one today, and I said, wow, we're growing again. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Robert, did you have Yeah, I did have just one more comment. Um, you know, as we talk about how we do some of the things, and you mentioned, you know, marketing and being able to kind of get the word out so people know about it, uh, I'm going to kind of double back to Bob's comment that that takes money. Right? And so whether it's, whether it's coming from CVB, Visit Fort Worth, what they are raising, whether it comes from the chamber and what they're raising, where there comes from the city allocating dollars in the general fund. I mean, that, that costs money in order to do that effectively. Um, and so, um, unless we have some of those resources, again, across all three of these agencies to do some of those things, we, we can only do what we have resources to do something with. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the next thing, light bill, yeah. Jennifer, I have some questions. I apologize, I don't know the, the time horizon for your plan. 
but what's the length of each of your plans and when we're done, which not that it's ever done, but what does that look like? Well, I would say our plan, you, you know, our, we thought in terms of 10 years for some of, you know, because some of these things are very long-term projects. Some of them are pretty immediate, but it would be my expectation that five years in, we're gonna be back and revisiting that and updating it. Our, our plan is a little bit different than, you know, because ours was not about our organization per se, but it was more about community assets and strategies that would support a tourism economy. And so within that, you know, and, and modeled in many respects after downtown Fort Worth Inc.'s master planning process and, and how they looked at downtown and what are elements that are important to a successful and thriving downtown. We looked at the city and said, what are elements that would support an active and vital tourism industry? So our, so our outcome here or our end result of our work is a little bit different than, than what Robert and um, Jared are representing, but that's 10 years. And I'll say jump in on ours. I mean, so ours is a five-year plan, uh, but I will say that you know, in that 500-page document that has 200-plus recommendations of things we need to do over the next five years, some of those are some very short-term, near-term uh, objectives that we want to get done. Some of them happen within that five-year window, and some of them are five, ten years and beyond. So even though you know, five years is, is kind of how we set that plan, uh, there are things in there that are going to have to continue to be reevaluated, readdressed, looked at. Uh, I will say, you know, one thing that, that both plans talked about is, is increasing uh, the number of Fortune 500 companies in the city, increasing the Inc. 5000 companies in the city. We talked about, I think it was 2,000 new jobs we're trying to create above that Tarrant County medium wage. Uh, we talked about new residential investment uh, around the central business district. We talked about, um, increasing the number of startups uh, overall. So there are some, some key specific performance metrics, uh, both on an annual and from the life of the plan um, concept in both of those documents. So as it relates to the Chamber's plan, uh, the strategic plan is a four-year plan. Uh, and if we are successful at the end of about 18 months, you will start to feel the impact of the, ch of the Chamber's work. Specifically, as it relates to small business, uh, the impact of what we do will be perpetual. Uh, the goal is to build an ecosystem that continues to feed itself and produce results. Uh, and this is why I'm so, I'm busting at the seams wanting to tell you all about the strategy, but we're talking about building an ecosystem that will produce uh, per per in perpetuity going forward. As soon as we raise the money to make it happen. And I, the, the, uh, candidly, we will roll out the strategy within the next 90 days. Uh, that doesn't mean we can execute the strategy in the next 90 days because it does take funds to execute. But you'll have more information. In fact, if you'll have us back, if you'll have us, the chamber, us being the chamber back, we'll tell you all about it. I think the follow-up is. Well, we would want to welcome you back. Uh, and thank you all for being here with us today. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda, and we'll wait a few seconds, but we have uh, Officer Bernie Norris, President of the Fort Worth Black Law Enforcement Officers, and Officer, uh, he's the President, and Officer Nestor Martinez, he's the President of the Fort Worth Chapter of the National Latino Law Enforcement Organization. So if you all can come up to the... <laughs> Uh, as y'all remember, uh, at our last meeting we had the POA here and we had asked to see the Latino and Black Officers Association be present as well so we can hear about what they are doing within the police uh, 
officers or the city of Fort Worth and their organization and how they support each other. So, Nestor, Brandon, I know who wants to go first. Uh, good evening. Thank you, everybody, for inviting us again. I uh, appreciate y'all's time. Um, some of the stuff we've been doing here recently um, over the last week as an association is hosting our uh, 2018 police games here in Fort Worth. Uh, we had a social event and we participated in actually organizing several of the events here in the city of Fort Worth with our membership along with the POA and the BPOA as well. Uh, that re went real well. We hosted probably about 2,000 uh, people into the city, um, showed them around, uh, took them to participate in these games. I think it was a real good turnout and uh, not only that, real positive um, impact for people to say, hey, we, we'd like to come into Fort Worth and we'll continue to visit them. Uh, unfortunately, next year is going to be in Abilene, so we won't get another opportunity to do that for a while, but I think that went real well. Um, obviously, we continue to do our scholarship uh, awards throughout the year. Uh, myself, we've been able to give at least six this year uh, to students in Fort Worth ISD along with officers, uh, students, or officers' children that are participating in some of the colleges here in the area. Uh, and just social events, we have a different uh, gala that's at the end of the year that I'm planning. Uh, you know, Fort Worth has never had a policeman's ball, and, and the NLEO is actually really proud of hosting that. Uh, we started again after kind of a three-year hiatus on that. Uh, we started again last year at the Omni, so uh, this year we're having it again in December. So hopefully that'll go by real well as well. <clears throat> uh, once again, thank you for having us. Um, with the, the Black Four of Black Law Enforcement Office Association, this year we were able to do, uh, speaking to the education piece, we were, we helped with a program called Read to Win, and um, that program showed measured, marked improvement through elementary school kids' reading level, something that we go into the schools and we help them do with their, we help them come up with reading programs to help them increase their reading level, which will help better them coming down their education process. Um, this year we also were able to give out uh, three scholarships to four or five SD seniors that were going to uh, colleges around, the, around the, the area in Texas. Um, that was something also that, that we were able to do, instead of just giving out money, we also were able to give out laptops to each one of them, which the laptops will be able to guide them throughout their whole matriculation through college. Also, we partnered with a lot of the community leaders, uh, the churches, the businesses, and we hear some of those issues and problems that they're hearing, and me personally, it's, I'm glad to hear that some of those issues are being addressed in this room as far as the economic standpoint, small businesses and things of that nature. We continue, we plan to continue our community outreach with the communities in the schools and with the neighborhoods, the churches, and everybody in the communities that we do serve. No, you just, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you're pointing over here. Uh, gentlemen, I, I'd just like to get your assessment of how you would grade your department and how it deals with complaints of police brutality. Do they do it well? Are they liking? How would you grade the Fort Worth Police Department in dealing with complaints about police brutality? Me personally, I would say that our department is kind of ahead of the curve. Um, most of our officers are, do have body-worn cameras now, and that alleviates the, the, the fact of who's telling the truth or who, who may have been lying. Um, we have uh, steps and processes that it goes through. People that has to be, the whole situation has to be looked at. There's an investigation. Witnesses are contacted. Quote unquote victims are contacted as well. The process is, it's a thorough process so to see that justice is served in either situation. So I think that our, our department is ahead of the curve in that. And when you say ahead of the curve, is there anything you see liking in what your department is doing? as it relates to this issue. Some things that I, that I see, and I'll go back to kind of reflect what he said, our department is ahead of the game when it comes to uh, investigations on these use of forces, to training for the officers that are out there on the field, the use of body-worn cameras to actually um, kind of negate some of those complaints uh, and, and turn them into uh, you know, complaints that are, don't have any merit. Uh, 
that and the culture that has turned in the department as well to say, hey, the body worn camera is a tool. It's not a negative within the department. It actually helps you, it helps you keep your reputation as a good solid department uh, when it comes to providing service for the community. Uh, the investigation portion as well, uh, it's a thorough investigation. We try to interview as many witnesses as we can. We've gotten to the point where we're actually um, going out and looking for camera footage within the area. Uh, we've established that going out there to these business owners. If an incident does happen in a certain area, we're able to canvas that area and see where the cameras are located so we can get an outside perspective or a different angle of whatever incident happened or occurred. Um, I think our police media relation is good. It could be better. And when I say that, just to give us the time and the actual effort to finish our investigation uh, before anything is put out so that we don't have to negate something or that the media has to negate anything when it comes back to the information put out. Uh, so yeah, we're doing a good job as far as that, but everything can always be improved. And when I say everything can always be improved, funding for new training, funding for better equipment, funding for just going out there and recruiting good officers, that stuff can always improve uh, with any department, but ours specifically. Just one last one for me. Oh, I can't get one, but um, when it comes to discipline of officers within the department for alleged abuses or policy uh, infractions, is there a difference in the treatment of minority officers versus white officers? I'd like your assessment of that. Over the years, we've kind of, we've worked on a matrix, a disciplinary matrix, so that we can be consistent with the either punishment or disciplinary issues that are involved in a use of force or things of that nature. Um, maybe before our time, there was, but to this point, we are very involved. And when I say we, our associations are very involved in uh, establishing that disciplinary issue. We're invited to these meetings to, to uh, review discipline to be a part of the process when it comes to even a review board when it comes to the last meeting that the chief is going to have with this officer before termination we're invited to be there to either uh, counsel or set up some kind of uh, dialogue that we can uh, address with the chief reference the investigation so i don't know if that answers your question or not but it has changed from what it's been in the past. I would agree with you, but if I told you there are members of both of your organizations who would say there is discrimination in discipline within the department when it comes to Hispanics and African Americans, you would disagree with that? I would disagree with the, the statement because if you have a pool of officers that only makes 21% of the officers in the department, obviously you're gonna see a different type of disciplinary issue. So if the department is composed of 1,600 officers and 60% of those officers are white and 20% of those are Hispanic, you can still have the same type of uh, discipline across the board, but if you see more officers of a minority race being disciplined uh, through the department, it's because it's less. We have less officers. If we had more of a a diversified department, I think that would be a different number that you would see, if that makes any sense. No, you that doesn't make any sense, uh, yeah. but you would have it be the other way around, wouldn't you say? You have more white officers, you think you have more white officers disciplined versus black or Hispanic. Well, I think at this point we're talking about disparate treatment between the two, not, you know, who gets disciplined more, who gets disciplined less. Um, I agree, I agree with you, there's 60% more white officers than if there were equal amount of infractions across the board, they probably would get more because there are more of them. But we're talking about disparate treatment among people that have done something, some sort of violation, and it's the same violation, and they get different treatment, okay? And I think what, what he was speaking to is, is in, our in our time of policing, that has gone down and those numbers have significantly reduced from what we've seen due to the matrix, due to there being checks and balances along the line of punishment. It's not just one person making a decision off of how they interpret the infraction or how they interpret the rule. It is multiple people in that chain that get a chance to look at all of the evidence provided to them 
and then they make a re recommendation from there. But is there room for improvement is what I'm asking. There, there's always definite room for improvement. Somebody had a question. Okay. I had a question. Um, is there any process, you mentioned that you all are present in meetings uh, when these disciplinary actions are happening. Is there any inclusion of your members uh, within the programs in the department aimed at racial and cultural sensitivity? Are your officers, the resources that they bring to the table, made do so? Uh, to, to answer that, yes, there, there, there is inclusion in many different aspects of what's going on within the police department um, as far as, let's say, pro, um, specialized units. We have a diverse panel of people sitting on the board to help assess this candidate for a specialized position when in years past there would be just one demographic of officers sitting there assessing this person for their suitability for a position, things of that nature. And um, there's many people involved with the, with the, the matrix, our disciplinary matrix, the changes that need to be done, our use of force policy, and the changes that need to be done in that as well. So across the board, we are, we are involved in each aspect. Do you feel that's true for Hispanic officers as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely, because uh, we're, we're, like I said, this, this is a, a several year process that we've gotten to the point that we are now, and there's more people of minority, uh, that are participating in these panels and these boards. Not only that, even in the education of officers that we have, uh, our perf training, it's, it's a very diverse uh, group of individuals that provide that training to the officers already in the department. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's there. Uh, like I said, there's always room for improvement, but we're, we're very much involved in, in that process. And to follow up, how do you feel about recruitment efforts to increase the number uh, people of color as well within the department, and so that we would have uh, more than 40% of people of color as officers. Is there is there recruitment, active recruitment efforts being made? Are there those efforts being made? I, I think that at, uh, at this time there are active recruitment efforts being made. Can they be improved? Yes. Uh, I think this city is full of qualified candidates that are here right here from Fort Worth, that are Fort Worth homegrown, that can be quality police officers that can serve their citizens and can serve this city. And they would have a, uh, an affinity for their area because this is their city. This is where they live. This is where their parents live. It's where they grew up. So there is an effort in recruitment. Can it be better? Yes. We've, uh, we've addressed colleges all over the nation. And when I say colleges, I mean primary black colleges that, that are all over Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi, we go out there. But the end result is that we'd like to continue to bring people from Fort Worth. Uh, and when you, we only have one officer that's out there in charge with that task, it's kind of difficult. Uh, but yeah, we continue to do that. And we recruit within our own same organizations. Uh, if we see a guy from Dallas, you know, I've brought several officers from Dallas myself just by giving them the benefits and letting them understand that we are a good city and we have a good department, but we always need good officers. Uh, just the growth, the demand for, for officers out here, it, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very present. I mean, you see it. You see it because, uh, like these gentlemen were talking about, uh, everything that they said, uh, it touches with us because we need the department to grow and we need that department to grow the right way when it's uh, in order for it to reflect the community that it serves. So yeah, we are very involved in that as far as the organization is concerned. Is there some recommendation that this task force might be able to make that could help As far as recruitment or just in general department wise? Specifically with recruitment, but also in general. Uh, me personally, I think that if we had, if our recruitment department division was, um, if we had more people that were actively dedicated to that in that situation, things, I think things would be better. And then also planting the seed at a, at a younger age, maybe some sort of uh, law enforcement courses at a high school level. Planting that seed at a younger age, because there's a, there's a lot of people in our city that they never think about being police officers until 
you know, high school, they, they graduate high school, college wasn't the route for them, they went military. And once they do military, they come back, police is automatically their next stepping stone. But there's an opportunity there where we can reach them right in that time frame where, hey, we can drop this seed in their, in their, main, in their mind and it might blossom into something good. And I'll, and I'll share this, it was kind of funny, but my partner said it over there, if you, if you want to make milk, you still have to have a refrigerator to store that. And that's where our police department comes into play. You have to have the infrastructure for that development and that growth to be safe, to function, to have the traffic, uh, safety, everything. We are part of the city and we're gonna grow, but unfortunately we haven't. Uh, for a whole year, we haven't hired anybody on the department. Uh, we haven't increased our specialized units. We have, we have no funding when it comes to that. Uh, it's very limited. So yes, a, a city this size and a city that has two million something visitors uh, every year deserves an agency that's a little bit more than over 1,600. 9.1 million. So yeah, that, and we could go out there and recruit all day long when it comes to officers uh, to reflect. But when we don't have that capability to train those officers and bring them onto the department, yeah, it's just not gonna work. Thank Corey and Walter. Mr. Dan, uh, yeah, I I appreciate you guys being here. That was a we tried to get a meeting set up with you guys before, and I appreciate the fact that y'all are all meeting together now, and you did have a chance to meet before you all together before you met with us and talked about our organization. Uh, you may not be able to answer me now, but or, or, or to get into your conversation that you had, which is I think it's great that you're meeting. <coughs> Were you, some of these questions we're asking you now, were these some of the things you talked about in those meetings? Uh, I would say definitely so. Some, like, as far as recruitment, um, retention, uh, use of force issues, disciplinary issues, these are all, all topics that we have discussed. And depending on the incidents that may have happened, or if there's no incidents happening, there's always room for improvement and change. So Your answers that you've given us now would have been the same answers whether you met with them or not, the others or not, right? Yes. These, these issues that you're asking, that you're uh, wanting input on, these issues are not just uh, here in Fort Worth. They're across the nation. So you're gonna get the same answer. When, you say, when we say, hey, we wanna improve this, we want diversity in our police department, we wanna be able to better our city as a whole, you're gonna get that across the nation. It's not. But, but we wanna be better than others. Walter, well, can you speak up? But just a quick question. No, I'm just asking you to speak up. And I think we are. But the other question is this, what are we doing in uh, the police department to strengthen community relations? Uh, us in particular, we, we're, we, we try to go as many community events as we can. We try and, and hold community uh, functions from whether it be a 4th of July parade in the community so they can see us and talk to us and pick our minds about things, uh, whether it be um, uh, dads at Dunbar, for, uh, high school, Dunbar High School. Every the last Friday of every month, they have dads at Dunbar. Where we're there to talk to some of those high school students, whether it be a Juneteenth parade on tomorrow, being out there in the neighborhood so that they can see us, they can see us, who we are, know our names, and speak to us and have those real conversations that we can only have at those levels, to where we can speak to them and understand things, and we can understand each other. Being out there in the community, that's the things that we continue to do and we're going to do. As, as an organization as well, you, you go out there and you try to see what's going on, feel the pulse of that community that you're serving. Our department uh, has a lot of pride in its MPO program, uh, neighborhood police officer, which is in charge of one particular demographic area. Uh, they go out there and they, they see what's going on. They know what meetings are taking place in their community, in their rec centers, uh, in their churches. They go out there and they, they do that. And they go out there and they invite the command staff. They invite their supervisors. They invite the chief. They can't make it, obviously we have different issues and different things that we gotta take care of, but it comes back to the more we're out there, the more we understand what's going on in the community, and we have a very good MPO program. Our organizations are very in tune with that as well, not only here in Fort Worth, but in Dallas and Houston and all the places that I have chapters as well. Corey? You said you'd like to cultivate them when they're young. Do you think bringing back the cadet program would be a good idea? As, as far as I've known, I didn't know the Explorer program was gone. Are you, are you no, 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 the Explorer program is still in existence, okay. but the cadet program is where you actually leave ages, starting as ages, both age 14, to try and get them in the mindset of uh, 
that it was a, it was a funding issue. Definitely. I, I think any any situation where you can drop that seed of knowledge at a young age to where they can grasp on it and think of on it themselves and let it blossom would be a great situation for us to be in. A program within the department that actually breaks down that uniform, for example, because a lot of people are scared of the uniform, that lets them realize that, hey, these are people, they care about their community, they want to see the youth in a better situation than they are. Any program that promotes that, absolutely. The PAL program is something that we've been pushing for at least two years now. We only got one officer that's dedicated to that right now at this point in the city of Fort Worth. Our five-year plan was given through uh, Chief Fitzgerald and Chief Halstead, I believe, was the one that planned the seat for that. He gave us an agenda, said, work on this for five years and let me know. This is what I want you to I want to see in five years. We finished our, our board. We finished our, our bylaws. We finished our, our business, uh, I guess, uh, the business... Um, model for that program and we we were done a year in advance in that so we're set up it's just having the officers that are out there dedicated for that one last question you, you both said that you believe the police department is ahead of the curve correct in a lot of things and being progressive on some things correct would you agree that we're behind the curve and what is your opinion on a citizen's review board behind the curve sorts Fort Worth does not have a citizen's review board. Okay, so Every major city board. just about does, except Fort Worth. So would you agree we're behind the curve on that? I would say yes. If, I mean, any kind of situation where we can have input from the people that we police is going to be a good situation. It's having that open dialogue, and like you said, breaking down the uniform is going to be a good thing to have. And you don't view it, never viewed it as a hindrance? I, I wouldn't view it as a hindrance, no. The review board for me is something that's very uh, sensitive because we have to have people on that review board that understand our daily dealings on the department and in the streets. If we have some kind of vetting process or some kind of application process for those people to actually go out with us for a couple of weeks or go through our policy and procedure very thoroughly, then yes, that, that should be a possibility. But having somebody that, that has a different agenda as far as what the department has. And when I say agenda, I mean not to, because uh, you can literally turn over a monster over every rock if you really wanted to. But to continue to that positive, uh, hey, we're going to make our community better. If somebody made a mistake, correct that mistake, provide training for future officers, and move on. That's the kind of training that we'd like those people to see. Not to keep us in the past, but to continue to move forward, because I think that's what our department's trying to do. And I know the chief of the, the police department has some training and thing that the citizens are invited to come to. We have those, and I'd be curious to see what the turnout is on those. How many people we actually see get involved in those programs. We have a simulator that we offer to the citizens every so often. A simulator that actually gives them a very detailed uh, and a lifelike situation where you have to use deadly force. How many people actually go to that? I did, and my son and his friend last week. <laughs> and it's it's a great experience, isn't it? It's eye-opening. Absolutely. Those are the type of programs that we need to have if, the, if there is a Citizens Review Board on our policy. It was in line. So with, with that type of education, then you wouldn't be opposed to a CRB as long as they, they're educated and, and, and exactly what they're looking at and not from a novice point of view. Uh, no, yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah, I'm sorry. Because you said you would it, It's gonna be a very detailed and very uh, SOP, I guess, procedure type of, of, of process. So I can't fully comment on it because something can change tomorrow, for example. Uh, I'd have to kind of look at the process and see how we're going to vet those people and see how, how we're going to do the training in order to say, hey, yes, I do agree with that. So we, so you're the hiring freeze, right? I, uh, uh, Chief Krause, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago with, with Mr. Sessions. So we're having the hiring freeze. And given the time it takes to train an officer completely, the demographics at best, once the freeze is lifted, at best, won't change for approximately two years. I give it about five years more than that. Thank you. Appreciate that. 
And again, I should say thank you guys for being here because I know it's like for you guys to be black police officers and Latino police officers and come back to our community. And you kind of catch it both ways sometimes. So I want to say thank you guys. Um, I think one of, one of the things that I think the, that this body has to do is to make uh, being a police officer more enticing to, to our community because right now we, we just don't have the interest because of some of the stigma that they deal with. But, but real quickly, now you said that you guys partnered with some churches, leaders in the black community. Who were they? Uh, again, um, I know for, uh, they said Pastor Bell was one of, one of the main ones they partnered with on the east side. And the police partnered with Dr. Michael Bell? That, this, again, this is, this is what, I, what the information that I received from my board, of course. So these, these were some of the things. And then they said here in the recent past, he's been more of, he's had more of a abrasive relationship with the police department. Oh, you're talking about the three coalitions. So I, I do get that part. Now, now uh, I do get that part. Now, you guys meet with the POA, and you said that you guys have representation there. Are you part of the meeting confer agreement? Do you guys have input in that? Or are you a voting entity and the POA as well? Both, both associations. We do meet with the POA. We will have a seat on the negotiation table whenever it comes to. We just finished it here uh, last year, I think, so we're not up due for another four years. Uh, my plan is to, and the only reason it, my plan is because I plan on being on that board. And when we have an executive position at this point, we need to be a full vice president or a full president on that board. And that's my thought process for the, the next four years. If we can do that internally as our organization grows and our leadership grows within our organization, just like his, then absolutely we'll accomplish that. Walter. If that can I ask you. Just real quick, this is the last one I was going to And you talked about the video cams and all of that, how it, it supports transparency. But to be honest, I think it's really whatever transparency that almost did exists, it, it's hurt that image, the more we see. And I said it before in city council, and I said it now, no matter how much money we spend on all this equipment, if you got officers who won't turn these things off and, 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 and won't record the entire incident, and what happens with the community is that they get bits and pieces, and by the time that the real truth allegedly is spoken, that we've already perceived the notion in our mind because of the way the information had to get to us. Um, so I, I think that that hurts us. It, it hurt you in a sense if you're not going to use those things and 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 fool and fool us. Uh, to that, I would say uh, again, we are progressing. We are being moving forward as far as body camera footage and things of that nature. And I would just say to you, the vast majority of these incidents that. The police officer doing everything right, you'll never see. People see people see the sensationalized thing. They see the things what media blows up. But there are many, many, many more incidents where the police officer does everything right along with protocol, everything right. Those situations, those those incidents where the alleged victim claims some sort of infraction, those are put down very quickly by watching the video, seeing what truly happened, what truly didn't happen, and they're. Uh, you know, complaint being unfounded. So just main thing, a lot of these videos that you're not going to see are police officers doing things 100% right. And there's many more of those than are officers doing things wrong. Keep in mind, technology continues to grow. And the way I want to touch base on that is that we're literally getting patrol units uh, equipped to where with these officers open the door, that camera's going to activate automatically. That's something that we didn't have five years ago. 10 years ago, somewhere around there. So yeah, uh, situations get intense. Officers forget stuff because unfortunately they're thinking for their lives at that point. And so they might not have the opportunity to touch that camera down on their, on their lapel or whatever, but the technology is getting more advanced. And even pulling out your taser, some have even suggested going to the system where you pull out your weapon and it actually activates your camera. So yeah, we're going to have better tools in the future, but it all comes back to how we're progressing as a department.
And I can't give him a data boy for doing his job, but the hundreds of videos that are right, that's just him doing his damn job. I think most of us are like that. <laughs> so those that show up and they're written on Facebook and they're out there on YouTube and then they're shown to be false. And then all of a sudden all the bad media has been taken off the social media pages. So there's a plus and a minus. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, what you said. It also goes back to what we discovered too is uniform training and actually practicing those things that are, that are taught in the academy as you come out. Because what we discovered too is in some instances with other officers we met with, is the fact that they take on that personal approach of the officers they're working with, which may be field training officers or whatever. And so I think they're working right now to, to alleviate that, correct that, to make sure that there's some standards that are set that everybody's following those same standards. We're, we're, we're getting to that point because we've progressed over years. Uh, since the time I've, I've been here on the department for 17 years, from the time I started to the time that we are now, people understand and officers understand that you have to do the right thing. You have to do the right thing out there. Whether you, whether you feel it's just or unjust at that particular moment, you have to do the right thing because people are watching and there's accountability for that as well. So our transition in our, I guess, our culture is changing as well too. Just because social media, you know, uh, video, access you know all the technology that's coming out there is is so readily available and so quick to come out but it goes back to we got to think about the fact well how is that to somebody's do just or do diligent i'm sorry to that due process you know if you come out with the video how is it you put it out to a community and it's wrong and then you taint the entire population for his court or his uh his trial so that stuff something the community needs to consider as well, you know, give that opportunity, give that investigation its full uh, investigation time and let that go out because at that point, you're who are you really uh, taking that justice away from the person that's being accused of whatever uh, he's being accused of? Okay. Uh, one final question for me, and I, I too thank you for being here. Uh, um, we got some of your uh, chain of command here a few weeks ago. And we particularly ask about disparities, the fact that very, I mean, there are several departments within the department that have no African-Americans and no or very few Hispanics in them. And when we asked why was that, we were told that it was because Hispanics and African-Americans really don't like to work overtime and don't want to be on call. And I just want to know if you, I mean, and correct me if I got this wrong, but that's what I heard. Uh, who, uh, I'd be curious to see who it was. Who, who said that exactly? Oh, did, did I get that wrong? Well, we asked why, why, okay. why, why weren't there... If that was said, I would disagree with that wholeheartedly. I would as well. Can, can you tell us why there were no African-Americans in squad and homicide and at least four or five other uh, areas? Because... We're so low on those numbers to begin with. I know what I heard. Cross, can we can no, no, verify? No. That's, that's the main reason right there. When you have a, a small pool to choose from, you're going to have less opportunity. The detective units, such as homicide major case, that don't have any African American. We only had, at the, at the time we pulled those numbers, we only had 16 detectives that were African American. We had 19 investigative units in the department. So. Some units aren't going to have a detective, an African American detective in it. Plus, there are other corporal positions, which is the same length as detective, that don't do investigations that also need uh, to be filled. And I'll kind of add to that. And I'm sorry, you can go ahead. Oh, man, I, I don't want to get into all of this very detail. That's why I haven't mentioned any because we have all that documented. Yeah. We've got that right now. But it did come up, like Bob Ray said, as to why they did not, they didn't call the African American Hispanic by name because they didn't have them, said they didn't want to work. So I assume that I can understand that what they're saying is that they don't want to work those hours. Uh, the same way with becoming a, uh, a field training officer. And so that was, that was mentioned. That's whether it's right or wrong, it, it was said. And so there's a lot of disparities in, in the areas that you just mentioned. But we've got it documented already, so it's not to challenge you at all. For me to challenge you on any of that stuff right now as well. Right now. Uh, well, and I would just recommend that we make sure that we get clarification because of what you. I would, and, and let me go ahead and add that I would 
I would clear that up more by saying there's, we don't have people that want to work those positions, period, in the department because they're so strenuous. They affect your life. They, the, everything that's called out, the times, this and that and the other, we, that's, that's across the board. It's not just black officers or Latino officers or anything. It's across the board. It's within our department. Because when, when, when I have people in specialized units calling me and telling me, Nestor, I need you to recommend or push somebody into this unit and, and, and encourage them to apply for it because we don't have anybody that's willing to apply for it. Yeah, absolutely, but at this point, I'm done. I don't have any more people. All my good people are placed in those units and are actually working. So the, what you're talking about is a, a department wide issue, not just our organization's department-wide issue. What I'm talking about the statement that was made because you don't have SWAT or you don't have a field training officer because, and there are no African-Americans in there or Hispanic, or maybe maybe some Hispanic, but the fact is what was said was is that they didn't want to work those long hours. Well, I, so the only thing I can assume that they were talking about people of color. Well, I, they're not there. In that situation, I think it speaks back to, it's within some of these units, it's a complete lifestyle change. You, it's, it's, not, it's not just an easy switch sometimes. And that goes on throughout the entire department. If you, some officers don't wanna be on call with SWAT 24 seven, because they have 24 seven callback. You may be out with a, a, a birthday dinner for a family member or somebody, you get a call, you have to leave. And there's, there's some officers that don't wanna work the deep cover narcotics investigations where you're working with the drug cartels and things like that, putting your family and things like that at risk. There's some officers that don't want that. There are some officers that want to be good patrol officers and be good patrol officers for their their their, their time with the department. But if it was said, you can say it and speak for yourselves. Just go ahead and say, black officers and Latino officers are not lazy or petty social. No, no. I don't think that was. I don't think that was the intent. I don't think that was ever the intent because I, in our command I staff. I hope that wasn't the intent. Yeah, in our command staff, we have that communication, and I really don't think anybody on our command staff would would go with that. Well, like, we discussed this stuff, the issue of the task force meeting, so that's all in minutes as well. I mean, like, literally, that was the whole discussion of our meeting was the disparities and so training officers, so all of that stuff is discussed in the, meet, in the minute meetings as well, so I'm sure that's available to the whole task force if they wanted to go through it. Any other questions at all? So many black officers just up the rib. How many? Uh, how many black officers are right up the rib? This is a report that we have from 2018. Um, from 2018, the total of African American officers, we have 171 males and 98 females, making up 12% of the, uh, the department. So Chief Krause, I'll, I'll, accept, I'll accept what you say, Chief, from the perspective that they're limited in each area, but out of those numbers, we can't find one, I mean, one. As far as what, for those? For those, for those, those positions. We Latinos, you have 344 male and 105 females, which makes up 21% of the department. And I'll say yes to that because we're just so low on those numbers. And some people don't want to apply for those jobs. So as we write the final report recommendations, what recommendations come out from this week? What would you like to have recommended to alleviate some of the issues and to make us a top-notch police force where people are knocking at the door to try and get a job? Uh, I think it's some of the same recommendations I've been making this entire time as far as recruitment efforts, retention efforts, um, helping the continuing the process that we're doing with, with uh, the, the discipline matrix and helping with those disparities, putting even talking within officers, which we do among ourselves as, as associations about promotion, having the ambition to want to promote and go higher, or having the ambition to want to be in some of these other specialized units, um, and just continuing the outreach and the communication with the community. Um, we can't do our jobs without the community, and that's just, that's just the plain facts of it. We need the community, we need their input, and we need their, we need their, their uh, side of the story, so to speak. There, there's several things that we're, we're discussing within associations as well. You know, I hear all this stuff about the growth and the development throughout the city, and I've never once heard that 
police, fire, medical, that is an actual part of this growth and development. I mean, we've been here for about an hour and stuff, and we didn't hear anything that, that, that this was part of the, the growth and development. That needs to be addressed. That needs to be pushed, because without the structure and the safety, you, you can't grow. You can't do all that stuff, because it's going to come back and haunt you at the end. And when we say that, and when I also say that, go back and invest in your community. You know, encourage officers, I don't know, maybe an incentive for people that live in Fort Worth to apply as a police department, to continue to promote our police department as a good paying career that you can look for in the long run, and you can live in your city and be okay. You know, that, that kind of things are, are, are what we're trying to go out there in the community. We're trying to go out there and, and raise those kids to want to be police officers through our PAL program, through our mentorships that we have, our career days, things of that nature. But when we keep getting hit as a society throughout the nation, as far as law enforcement being a negative, law enforcement being a negative, that's always going to kill us in the long run. But we need to be included in that growth development of the city and as an overall mirror for who we serve, our city. Well, several, no, of, went, several of us went up and did the record, did the training. Several of us went up and did the training, and and I will tell you that the response is it was life changing. It was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Just just for the record, uh, the city does have a staffing study underway uh, for the police department and the code compliance department, and the initial findings should be available within the next few weeks. Will we be able to get? Yes. We look forward to that. We look forward to that. Jennifer, uh, you know, one of the things you're talking about, and I understand from other organizations I've been involved with, when the school is small and trying to attract and incentivize folks to, to aspire for those top positions. One of the things that I'm thinking about today is we talked and heard about younger generations and what they do and don't look for in a work life balance or integration, whatever you want to call it these days. Does the police department also need to look at the types of jobs and how jobs are created and have those evolve as well with the time so that you're not just trying to match the, the, the talent to the job, but also kind of adapting in the other direction as well? I think that was touched on with these gentlemen earlier about actually making, uh, he, he threw the number out there, uh, 50000 a year for a decent job in the city of Fort Worth. Our police officers start off with, correct me if I'm wrong, 58, 56, is that correct, Chief? Somewhere around there? 55, somewhere around there. So, I mean, it, it's, it's right in line with the minimum, with the minimum requirement of what these gentlemen are presenting. Why shouldn't it be a professional job, a profession that can be a career that's also an incentive to the city of Fort Worth? Because these, Ladies and gentlemen are going to be out here in, investing in these communities and wanting to. It's very, it's, it, you don't understand the pride that we had by actually hosting these gentlemen, these police officers from all over the nation. And when people come to Fort Worth, they like seeing us. And they, we, we, we try to accommodate. We're one of the best, uh, I guess, uh, promoters of the city. If you, if you talk to us on a regular basis. And that needs to be an incentive as well, too. So, I mean, that, that's an idea. And like I said, incentivizing the fact that you want officers to live in the city of Fort Worth that work here in the city of Fort Worth. One, one more thing. If, one, I was going to say one last question because it's already seven. We still have some other would you, to go over. Would you agree that um, because there's not diversity in a lot of the departments, the, the officers who are on patrol, there's a cut in pay to take a promotion because a lot of them do work other jobs and the income would be reduced because they'd have to devote more time. So that can be a hindrance as well, to have officers promote? Possibly. It, it, it possibly could be a hindrance, but also you see situations where some officers uh, will be in patrol for 15, 16 years. And for them to promote, they would end up taking a pay raise, get their rank. The first year, you know, th that would definitely be the same thing. So that kind of skews the number two. Yeah. Um, you know, it's again due to time. Uh, do we have one last important question that we've not or need to hear an answer that we've not already heard? 
Not a question, just a comment. Okay, so quick. My comment is, uh, I believe it's still in operation at Eastern Hills High School. We have a criminal justice program in fire safety. And I would, it would really be nice to get involved in that because in our first meeting, we had one of your officers that graduated through that program that's in the police department right now. I don't know how many others in there now as well, but it would be good to invest some time in that too. Through our organization, we've, we've thought about going to the TCCs, to the Northside High Schools. You have culinary at Northside. You have uh, medical professions at, at, is it Pascal? Why not have a school through the Fort Worth ISD that is strictly for law enforcement, whether it's attorneys, whether it's correction officers, whether it's police officers? We have Eastern Hills right now. That's one. Well, thank you for being here and spending your hour with us. Uh, we've got a lot of great information. <laughs> two hours, two hours. Two hours. That's five minutes. Uh, we appreciate you all taking the time to be here with us. Thank you very much. We appreciate you all as well. Thank you. Uh, next thing is uh, Fernando and Estrus an update on the leadership training, which I think we all have minutes from that as well. We have summaries of the first two of three leadership training sessions that we provided to city officials. And last week, we actually completed the third of three uh, leadership training sessions for the city council, board officials, department heads, and assistant directors. And I can, uh, I can summarize uh, that leadership training by saying that I think we made considerable progress in raising awareness among city officials about uh, the impact of uh, racism and discrimination uh, upon uh, our community and the way that we provide municipal services to all of our citizens. The training sessions, I think, uh, have been hard hitting. Uh, they have not uh, flinched from addressing uh, the hard issues about the history of institutional and structural racism in our country and our, our own community. Uh, the uh, City Council examined uh, the Jacqueline Craig uh, video uh, in detail and, and reached. Uh, difficult conclusions about that particular incident. Uh, we talked about uh, the use of common language to discuss uh, issues uh, about racism, which is important. Uh, we discussed implicit bias and conscious racism, uh, white privilege, white supremacy, how these uh, uh, biases uh, tend to infiltrate our policies and practices even subconsciously, uh, and uh, we learned about how other cities across the country are dealing with these issues. We had uh, a former mayor of Minneapolis uh, spend time with our city council. Uh, the uh, former deputy mayor of New Orleans was also part of the, of the group. Uh, we spent time talking about uh, the concept of targeted universalism, uh, we, whereby we set uh, common goals for all of our community while uh, targeting specific segments of the community that may have different needs uh, and approaching them in different ways. I think uh, the response is generally positive uh, to that idea. We talked about the importance of continued public engagement that even after the work of this task force is complete, the hard work really just begins. Uh, and uh, that will include the need for continued public engagement perhaps even intensified public engagement, uh, greater and more effective uh, continuous oversight of uh, implementation for whatever recommendations emerge from this task force, uh, tracking progress through uh, hard data, uh, shifting from a, a complaint-based response system to a needs-based response system. That's going to require a major shift in the way uh, city government functions. Right now, if you are an influential citizen, you can get whatever you want from city government quickly. Uh, that is implicitly biased. Uh, changing from that system to one that's based strictly upon need uh, in an attempt to reduce or eliminate bias 
who would require a major cultural change in the way the city government does things. Whether we're ready to do that or not is not clear at this point. But at least we recognize that it will require a major cultural and procedural change. We talked about uh, evaluating budget requests through the lens of uh, racial and cultural equity and how that would change the fundamental uh, budgeting process in city government so that we would still apply many of the same criteria, but we would add equity as a significant criteria for evaluating a budget request. Uh, these are examples of the difficult topics that we discussed. I would say that the city council in particular has advanced considerably. They will tell you that they have advanced considerably in their understanding about these issues, in their awareness and sensitivity to the issues. Are they at the point where you want them to be? I'm not sure that's clear yet. I think that's something you will want to determine for yourselves, uh, perhaps through direct communication with the city council. And, and I understand that the co-chairs have expressed a, an interest in meeting with at least some of the council members uh, for a, a candid discussion about these topics. Now, the law department will be quick to remind us that if you gather too many council members at one time uh, for a discussion, you'll have to provide public notice of the meeting, uh, which could discourage the kind of candid discussion you want to have. Uh, and so that's that's a topic that we will need to, to explore further. But I think, I think I can say that we have made considerable progress through the leadership training. It's been uh, difficult progress. Uh, if I were to say that everybody was equally enthusiastic about it, I would be misleading you, and you would not believe it anyway. Uh, uh, but uh, I think we have made real progress, and I think you should feel uh, pleased about it. And Estros can add to the perspective from the standpoint of community leaders and, and ordinary citizens who have been engaged in similar training. Yeah, and just very, very briefly, so we'll have uh, another round of engage interested citizens so these are the ones that kind of an all call they didn't require nomination we want to make sure we invited and engaged as many as possible that next one will be actually here at botanic garden tomorrow uh, and then next week we'll have uh, those nominated uh, community leaders will be convening uh, for the, the last round of those community conversations around engagement practices around shared uh, common language that uh, the city officials are using so that there be a, kind of a common bridge. Uh, without exception, e each of the community leaders' engagement has brought a diverse group of, of organizational leaders, neighborhood leaders, who are primed to partner with the city in advancing racial and cultural equity. So that continues to be excitement, exciting. We've got uh, scheduled, confirmed community leaders training for one city council person and waiting on three others who have already named, they want the training, they're just trying to work out the dates for them. Anyone has any questions? Next is the template for the committee recommendations, and you all should have a copy of it in your book. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you all should have uh, received electronically and in hard copy. The, uh, the template for the committee recommendation form and it has the, the green uh, shading uh, across the top. Uh, tab uh, number one in your uh, binder. Uh, we, we requested it last time, we promised we would provide it to you. Uh, this particular form has been reviewed by all of the committee staff and, and approved by the uh, co chairs uh, with uh, revisions that the co chairs made. Uh, and uh, I think it's important for me to emphasize uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Sanders uh, indicated at the beginning of our meeting. We are now uh, beginning the home stretch of the task force's work. Uh, and we are now at the point of taking the disparities we've already identified and formulating strategies that will effectively address those disparities. And, and therefore, uh, the co-chairs are requesting 
that by uh, Friday, August 3rd, as a deadline, that you provide your uh, final committee recommendations uh, to our staff so that the co-chairs might review them initially at their meeting on Monday, August 6th, in advance of the committees making presentations of the full task force at your August meeting on August 20th. So August 3rd should be the deadline uh, that you aim to, to meet uh, with these committee recommendation uh, forms. The co-chairs are requesting that the committees focus on strategic recommendations. What are the broad strategies that you recommend that we pursue to address the disparities? In fact, they're asking that you limit your attention to three to five broad strategies. Under each strategy, you may have a series of actions. Try to arrange them under uh, just a handful of broad strategies that will address the strategies. Even if we had three strategies from each of the six committees, that's 18 strategies. That's a lot uh, for this task force to, to consider. Now, some of those strategies will overlap, and that's why the co-chairs will need to review them to see uh, where they have uh, aspects in common, uh, and then they'll want to work with the, with the six committee chairs uh, to, uh, uh, to review all the strategies uh, so that we have a common set uh, to present uh, to the full task force for, for review and approval. So as you, as you march down uh, the, uh, the form, you'll see that we want you to recap the disparities, we want you to formulate the strategy and express it in a simple paragraph, then outline the recommended actions to implement the strategy, uh, including the time frames for executing those actions in one or two sentences each, potential challenges that you're likely to encounter in implementing uh, the strategies, and if possible, how other communities facing similar uh, issues have overcome those obstacles. We'd like for you to identify the responsible parties, who should do what to implement elements of the strategy, who should be the lead organization, who should be the support organization with respect to each of the strategies, what resources are necessary, financial and human resources, and finally success measures, how do we establish objective outcomes oriented data by which to determine how well we're doing uh, on progress toward the reducing or eliminating the disparities that the committees have identified. We want to know uh, the extent that those disparities exist today and where do we expect to be uh, or seek to be five years from now if we implement the strategy effectively. That's a lot to do. Uh, we spent a lot of time with the respective committee staffs reviewing the uh, expectations. Uh, they are eager to help uh, and uh, I will cite for example the, the health committee. They've already scheduled a half-day workshop uh, on their uh, strategy. Uh, they've already begun to identify what those strategies should be. So to address health disparities, for example, they know that one strategy will need to be uh, educating the community about health issues. So they'll have a series of recommendations, a series of actions that relate to educating the community. Uh, another series of actions will, uh, another strategic recommendation will probably relate to improved access to medical care. So we'll have a series of actions pertaining to improved access to medical care. We'll probably have uh, a strategy uh, that, that deals with uh, uh, better access to nutritious food. Uh, how can we get uh, more groceries? in Southeast Fort Worth, on the near north side, and other places that tend to have predominantly minority populations. Uh, we'll probably have an action, uh, a strategy that deals with, uh, 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 with uh, improved uh, fitness levels, uh, promoting more, act, more uh, active recreation in communities that have disproportionate levels of, uh, of diabetes or other chronic uh, uh, illnesses. Uh, these are examples, and I'm just using the, the health committee as an example. I, I think they're moving in the right direction, and I'm sure all the committees are, 
are moving in the right direction. But the emphasis is on uh, strategies that effectively address the disparities, uh, tying the actions to disparities and showing cause and effect. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. We don't have a lot of time to, to, to complete that work. Uh, we've had extensive discussions with the, co the, the four co-chairs. The idea is to have progress reports from the various committees to the task force at your next meeting in July. We're not expecting your final report in July, but we are expecting your final report in August. Uh, so that's a lot of work to be done in a short span of time, and we would encourage you to, to schedule all of your meetings accordingly between now and then. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, in August, You'll hear, you'll present the reports. Uh, we'll have subsequent meetings for the co-chairs, the co-chairs with the committee chairs. We, we'd like for the full task force in September to adopt a preliminary set of recommendations that will go out for public review and comment. And then in late September, early October, we'd like to have a series of open house meetings. In fact, I'd like to ask uh, Michelle Dude, if she would in a moment, to explain uh, what we're doing to organize those open house meetings across the city geographically. Uh, so it would be a different format from what we had in, in, in uh, the form of the town, town hall meetings. The town hall meetings uh, draw big crowds, maybe 150, 200 people, and folks wait for an hour, hour and a half to get their three minutes uh, at the microphone, and then they say there are three minutes. Uh, that's appropriate for, for many uh, purposes, but for the purposes of providing constructive comments on the detailed recommendations you're going to be making, we think it'll be a lot more productive to have the open house format, whereby you'll have uh, a series of seven or eight stations, at least six of which correspond to the six committees. And you'd have committee members staffing those stations and being available to answer questions and, and, and engage the public in constructive discussions. I, uh, I, again, Michelle can talk a little uh, further about that. Uh, so that's where we are with the committee recommendation uh, form. We urge you to follow the template as closely as possible. I think it's uh, going to be impossible to fit it on one page. And you'll probably need two or three pages for each strategy. And again, three to five strategies uh, for each committee. You've got good staff members who are providing you support. We're happy to provide you with whatever staff support you need. Uh, but the, the, the creative leadership is going to have to come from the task force itself, and we uh, encourage you to, to do so. I'm sure that's, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, if it's appropriate, I'd like to ask Michelle to comment further on the uh, open house. Um, as, as Fernando said, um, in order to get the best feedback and, and interaction with the people who, who come to the meetings, we were thinking about having four meetings in uh, different geographic locations. And at the meetings, we would have a table for each of the committees with the recommendations, and it would have staff and committee members there at the table so the residents can come in, find out more about it, and then give their comments on the particular recommendations for each committee. We will also have an online tool that will have each of the recommendations, and then people can comment and provide feedback on the recommendations electronically if they're more comfortable with that. But that's the plan right now. We're still working on locations because we want a nice big space so that people have plenty of room to go from table to table to find out the information and, and give their feedback. I think we're looking at dates in uh, late September, early October uh, for those uh, open house meetings. And if task force members have specific venues you'd like to recommend in different parts of Fort Worth for Michelle uh, to, to consider, please let us know. Uh, we'd like to, to hold these uh, open house meetings uh, in uh, locations that are easily accessible uh, to the populations uh, we're trying to serve. So what are your thoughts on that? Kind of college campuses. I mean, on the on the process. Oh, it sounds like a great idea. I think so. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you So, do you think the process is structured to get them? <laughs> but it's going to spark. It's going to spark a conversation, which was what That's didn't what take place That's in the town hall, yeah. which I didn't agree with. But. Yeah. yeah. 
But I, but I would think that there would it's be the miscellaneous a, duties as assigned. Yeah. <laughs> I would think there would be an overall brief presentation before we just tell them to go and find out. We can do that. Uh, uh, typically, uh, 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 yes. Uh, typically, the way this works, you'll have uh, the open house, let's say, from six to eight. And if a citizen is only interested in learning about the education recommendations, they can just go straight to the education table and talk to the education experts uh, about what they want. Uh, if they want to go to each table, they're free to do that too. If they want to spend two hours there, they can. If they want to drop in for 15 minutes, they can. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is often a good idea, maybe sometime in the middle of that uh, time frame, let's say at 7 o'clock, to have a, a brief uh, 10 or 15 minute program whereby one of the co-chairs talks about what the task force is doing and staff can provide a, a, a brief uh, generalized summary of the recommendations and encourage people to stop by the different uh, uh, stations as, as, as appropriate. Uh, so if you'd right. like, we can, we, can, we can work on a, on a presentation Maybe even a common video. That we, That's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. If we had a short video, we could have that plane play maybe play as they come in, yeah, exactly. and then they could come in, watch the video, and then go in. I think that also allows people more flexibility in their schedule. You know, if they really want to come, but they can only come maybe for the last 30 minutes or the first 30 minutes. If we had that short video, that makes sense. Yep. Um, we could just have that plane as they enter, and then they could go to the tables. So, well, option. well, I was I was thinking more so that there should be some type of general presentation first because there's going to be people that's interested in more than one thing. They get interested in everything that's there. But if they get that uh, a briefing on it all before they start, then then they have a, that opportunity to go whichever place they want to go. But just to uh, you know, but that could be something. That, that could that, be that. the presentation could be a video that's run well, one it time. Be, it, could be a, it could be a it could be a video, but at the same time, I, I think it ought to be a time for it to start and a yeah. time for it to end and have people there at the very beginning where they already go. And if they're saying, well, then you do your video, but I think we ought to come from, from the premise that we want, we want to gather a group of people there to view and understand and give their comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, next thing on our agenda is right. committee reports. Uh, Ty, are you okay. still on the line? I'm I, you know, Ty's not online. I've got time to report for him. You can text me. Uh, we meet again uh, July 9th, and we will begin work on the uh, on our on, on our template at that time. But also, there's a bit of recommendation too that we look at before we finish up. Look at the municipal courts. Okay. All right, uh, Charles. So staff is drafting some suggestions on this format. We won't meet until that has been done and sent out for the committee to review so we can come and have a productive discussion. Okay. Uh, is there anybody from education? Yeah, yeah the uh, committee met last Tuesday and reviewed the community recommendations form as well as reviewed our disparities and is looking to schedule a July 3rd meeting uh, to present this recommendation. Okay. Uh, help. Thursday night as well to try to do more of that. Uh, we lost a member of our committee, Terry, uh, took a job, a really good job apparently, yes. and sleeping. Um, but the staff is great and we have some momentum going forward. So I, I, we have to get a lot done because I'm going to be gone a lot in July, so I'm pushing to get a lot done before that so that when I come back, we can start honing them. Uh, I know transportation, we're meeting tomorrow to start doing the same thing that everybody's talked about, is start putting the recommendations together, start looking at the draft. So uh, we'll meet tomorrow. 
Okay, uh, you have a list of the future meetings starting on July the 16th all the way to December the 4th. Uh, so please, you know, mark those dates on your calendar. And as we move forward, especially for the outreach in September, we'll get those dates to you as soon as possible. Okay. Well, uh, in addition to the items you have on the schedule, I, I thought I'd mention uh, for information that the co-chairs and the committee chairs have been invited to meet uh, on uh, Wednesday, July 11th at noon with the Women's Policy Forum uh, for discussion about the task force work uh, and for uh, for smaller uh, roundtable discussions uh, about ideas to address disparities pertaining to each of the six committees. Uh, so uh, this is an important opportunity to engage uh, influential community leaders uh, in the Women's Policy Forum about issues of, uh, of racial equity. And uh, we encourage all the co-chairs and committee chairs to participate in that meeting. And to the degree that you can come, I think it would help to socialize what we're doing, have a conversation with people, and uh, it gives you a, a great feedback. I'm talking to the committee staff, and can certainly you know, give us some feedback. That, you know, I have to wait till the end of the project to go back out to the community. They are the community. Uh, closing remarks, co-chairs. I just, uh, I was on the agenda to just have a brief discussion and had hoped that more people would be here, but we seem to, um, we seem to be fainting. You know, Isaiah talks about uh, not faint. We're almost at the end, so I would just ask that everybody stay focused. You know, you were placed on this task force for a reason, because of your strength, your knowledge, your commitment to Fort Worth. And, and just your ability to either be that formal leader or be the informal leader that can lead the formal leader. So please, please stay engaged. We're almost there. Yes. And I know that we all love Fort Worth. This is so important. And what happens in the future is going to be a lot dependent on what we do today, now. So don't faint with us. And if you want to go back and read Isaiah, where is it, Mark? Oh. In the box. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember either more. Oh, I'm sorry to put you on the spot there, but, uh, but you know it hangs on my wall. I should know the answer to this myself. I say a twenty-eight. Thank you, sir. Whoa, thank you. Sir. Thank you. We just had to find it. I knew we knew this, but I called on it. And if you want to read that, just read it. It talks about just just walk in and, and the meaning is is walk in with whatever it is that you're doing. <clears throat> and if we want to take it to today's you know what we're doing and just don't fight just keep depending on the group and depending on yourself and your strengths and of course we're all operating out of god's grace and faith so don't faint on us at the end here well, you know. i've said enough tonight thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe that I'm it's over because i'm afraid that it's going to hit me uh, I just want to thank you all for staying involved and you know what we do today is, uh, as Lily said is going to help for the future. Uh, we've got to remember our past but we should be dwelling on the past because we have to look for the future. Today's a different day than what it was in the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. Now have things changed? In some places, maybe not. They may have improved some, uh, but are we there yet? No. And we shouldn't give up on that, but we should look towards the future because that's how we're going to make Fort Worth better. Uh, thank you all for being here, and we'll see you next time. It's an exciting time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.